Today, it's stage one of a potent street strip 347 cubic inch small block Ford full of power potential. Welcome to Engine Power and a new high powered project. The Ford Windsor series of engines debuted in 1962 with the creation of the 221 cubic inch small block V8. It became the most popular performance foundation for Ford. We know it as the 5.0. In 86, it adopted electronic injection, long runners, and a new head to crank out 200 horse at 4,000 and 285 pound feet of torque at 3,000. To keep on the path of power and interesting projects, we're going to keep the gears turning with a new one we're going to call Little Black and Blue. And it's to relate to all of you DIY Blue Oval gearheads. The recipe goes like this, 347 cubic inches, a set of AFR 205cc Renegade cylinder heads, Lunati valve train, and an Edelbrock Victor Junior intake manifold topped off with a tricked out quick fuel 750 CFM carb and all that's going to be lit off by MSD ignition. Specific output in an engine is expressed by horsepower divided by cubic inches, and with our parts combination, we should make between 1.35 and 1.44 horse per cube, and that's due to the ability of 93 octane pump gas to resist detonation. So, with a little quick math, we should make between 468 and 500 horsepower. Saving money at the beginning of a project leaves you more funds down the line for better parts. That's why we picked up this fully inspected, machined, and finished late model 302 block from Summit Racing. It was inspected for cracks and fatigue by being magnafluxed. Then it received an align hone. The decks were also cleaned up, and it was bored, then finished hone using torque plates to a final 4030 bore. Plus, all the dowels, freeze plugs, and oil gallery plugs are already installed, making this a cheaper route than tearing yours down and taking it to the machine shop. The most important thing for us is they clearance the bottom of the cylinder so our rod bolt clears it due to the larger stroke on the crankshaft. Now, all this for only 750 bucks. The block is shipped with an anti-rust coating that has to be removed before assembly. Now, we'll use lint-free towels and lacquer thinner to get rid of it. Now, Pat is giving it a visual inspection to make sure there's nothing else to do before assembly. What he's looking for are burrs, rough edges, or anything that jumps out and catches his eye. You know, I've been machining and building engines for over 25 years, and I can tell when someone has great attention to detail, and this block really shows a lot of that. All of the freeze plugs were installed with the lettering aligned. There was no overspray, and a lot of attention was given to the deburring process. Filling that block is an Eagle Specialty Products 4340 forged rotating assembly. Now the crank has a 3400 stroke and received their ESP armor finish, which is not a coating. It's a process that gives the material a mirror-like finish without changing any of its tolerances. Now it's so slick, it reduces friction, which reduces heat and allows your engine to make more power by reducing parasitic drag. Our rods are Eagle's forged H-beams that have a 5400 center to center length and the cap is held in place with 8740 ARP rod bolts. Now our pistons are Mala's forged 4032s with a negative 6cc valve relief. Now these things have a 1.5, 1.5, 3mm ring pack and a 1090 pin location. Now the protective coating on the side of the skirt is there to protect the engine during cold startups. Now all that will ride on proven Clevite bearings. Our starting point for this build is to check main bearing clearance, so the upper halves of the H-series main bearings will go in the block. The lower halves are put in the caps and then placed in the registers. The stout main stud girdle from Moroso stabilizes those smallish main caps so the engine stays together at high RPMs, which is our goal. Next, we'll measure each of the crankshaft's journals and transfer that measurement to the dial bore gauge, which we'll use to measure the torque bearing's IDs to find our clearance. We need between 23 and 28 ten thousandths to fall within our minimum clearance requirement of one thousandths per inch of journal diameter. This one fits the bill. The journal diameter plus the clearance, which is in the middle, equals the bearing's inner diameter, which all of ours are in the go zone, so the crank's ready to drop in. Royal Purple Max Tough will lube the bearings to prevent damage during fire up. Now the crank is slowly lowered into place, making sure it meets the bearings evenly. The main caps can be put in place and seated using a rubber mallet. 
and reinstall the main girdle for the final time. Using a dial indicator, we need to check our thrust clearance. And with six thousandths, the build continues right after this. Coming up, we focus on induction production. Our latest project, Little Black and Blue, is ready for the rest of its rotating assembly. Now we already checked the rod bearing clearance and hung the pistons to the rods. So the next order of business is to dress the pistons with their new rings. They're Mala's performance file fit ring set that have a standard tension. We'll install the oil support rail first. Now if this is not used, plan on clearing out the mosquito population when you run the engine. Now the expander followed by the other support rails. The second ring, which we gapped to 22 thousandths, can go on now, followed by the top ring, which was gapped to 18 thousandths. With oil coating the pistons and rings, lube on the rod bearing, we can drop the assembly into our ring compressor, place it over the number one bore, making sure it's aligned with the journal, knock it into the bore, then gently seat the rod onto the crank's journal. Now ease the cap into place and snug up the rod bolts. Ready? Yep. With all eight installed, we can torque the rod bolts to 63 foot-pounds. Remember the rod bolt clearance at the bottom of the cylinder we mentioned earlier? Well, here's what it looks like. Just an FYI, this clearancing would cost you an extra hundred bucks at the machine shop. The rotating valve actuating mechanism, which is a fancy term for camshaft, is a Voodoo series from Lunati. Now it has some pretty healthy specs with 241 degrees of duration on the intake, 249 on the exhaust on 110 degrees of lobe separation, and it has 600 thousandths lift on both intake and exhaust. The RPM range is from 3000 to 7000, and it needs to be paired up with good flowing cylinder heads to maximize its potential. To keep it in place is a milling thrust plate torque to 120 inch-pounds. Now the Lunati billet timing set with multiple keyways can be installed straight up and torque the cam bolt to 40 foot-pounds. Now our Felpro timing gasket can go on followed by the Summit Racing timing cover and ATI timing pointer which is all held in place with ARP fasteners. Controlling engine vibrations is an ATI SFI approved super damper held in place with an ARP crank bolt and torqued to 100 foot-pounds. Now we'll roll her over and drop in the ARP oil pump drive shaft, bolt the Melling high volume oil pump in place and attach the Moroso oil pickup. Now the one piece pan gasket can be laid down and aligning it are ARP's bullet nose studs. Now their front sump seven quart oil pan can drop on over those studs. It's designed for street strip use and will clear stroker crankshafts. Now back up top, these slicked up Lunati hydraulic roller lifters can go into the blocks 875 lifter bores. We have some interesting plans for this engine, so we had to choose a cylinder head that worked not only for this combination, but also for stage two we have hidden up our sleeves. Now these are Airflow Research's 205cc Renegade Competition heads. Now they're designed for race or heavy street strip use. They're fully CNC machined from the exhaust port to the intake runner, as well as the combustion chamber, which also houses a 2080 intake and a 1600 exhaust valve. I'm removing the valve spring so we can check for pushrod length. Now this involves using a lightweight checker spring so the plunger of the hydraulic lifter does not get compressed. The head gasket and cylinder head will go on the deck and one bolt will hold the head in place. Now the guide plate and rocker stud are installed since it affects the pushrod length. The adjustable pushrod checker is positioned on the lifter and using a sharpie, color in the top of the valve stem. Then place the rocker arm on the stud. Adjusting the pushrod checker will allow us to center the roller tip of the rocker on the center of the valve stem and tighten the rocker nut so it just touches the fulcrum. Now the engine is rotated so the roller tip of the rocker arm leaves a mark on the valve tip, which is the amount of sweep the roller moves on it. We're looking for a narrow mark on the center of the stem, 
which indicates the valve train geometry is correct for this application. All of this is dictated by the push rod length, which is 6600. After you determine your length, a quick call to Summit Racing will have new push rods on your doorstep in no time at all. We'll be right back. With luck on our side, we're able to continue assembling Little Black and Blue. That's because we found a set of 5 16 push rods that just so happen to be the perfect length in our equipment cage. Now before these go in, we need to prep our head bolts. By applying ultra torque between the shoulder and the washer, plus thread sealant on the threads since the lower ones go into the water jackets of the block. It's a good practice to coat them all though, so the same torque value is achieved across the head. We'll torque them to 65 foot-pounds. On performance builds, push rod length is never set in stone like OEM applications. Different cam core sizes, valve lengths, lifter types, and rocker arm ratios are all factors in determining the correct length. Now the two-piece guide plates and rocker studs can go on, and use the rocker arms as an alignment tool to get the guide plate in the right position. Now torque the rocker studs to 50 foot-pounds. Using a TIG welder, tack them together in three places. Using a MIG here will get too much splatter on the engine. Now drop in the push rods and apply extreme pressure lube on the contact area between the push rods and the rocker arm cups to protect them during initial fire up. With the number one cylinder at TDC, we'll set its valves up at a quarter turn past zero lash. With all the rockers lashed, we're ready to seal the valley using Fel Pro gaskets and silicone on the china rails. Securing the intake are ARP studs, which also help align it during installation. It's a Victor Junior single plane intake manifold, has an operating range from 3,500 to 8,000 RPM and accepts 4150 square bore carburetors. Now we can torque it to 26 foot pounds in a cross fashion. Then repeat this process a few times since you will get gasket compression. It's lights out for the valve train with these Summit Racing cast aluminum valve covers. They let you know little black and blue's cubic inches and that it's a stroker. We're using an electric water pump to avoid parasitic drag. We want to pull every bit of power out of this engine on the dyno. Controlling our spark is this Pro Billet distributor from MSD. This is a race version with no vacuum advance and now has no mechanical event since we've locked it out. One crucial thing we have to change is the distributor gear. You can't run an iron gear on a steel cam. In this case, the materials hate each other and you'll get almost immediate failure on your distributor gear. A composite or bronze gear like this one from MSD will solve the problem. The bronze material is softer than the camshaft gear, allowing for a friendly mesh between the two. The gear isn't hard to change, but its position on the distributor shaft is crucial. Luckily, MSD provides the correct dimensions for its placement on this sheet. Using a roll pin punch, Gently tap the existing pin out of the shaft. And with our Dake Arbor Press, we can remove the gear, which is press fit, from the shaft. Now press the bronze gear into position, making sure the hole in the gear is 90 degrees from the original hole in the shaft. And following your specs from the pink sheet, a dial caliper is recommended, not a tape measure. We're really close, so a few thou more, and we're in business. Once you're positive it's correct, carefully drill a 125 thousandths or eighth inch hole through the shaft and install the supplied roll pin. With lube on the gear and the o-ring in place, it's ready to drop in. Normally red, we added our own duplicolor touch in Ford Blue. Wrapping up the front is this thermostat housing we got from Summit. Now the valve covers are topped off with trick little breathers from Spectre. And to get ready for the carburetor, a gasket, a UCM 1 inch CNC carb spacer, another gasket, our dyno throttle plate, another gasket, and finally, this quick fuel Black Diamond Q Series 750 is going to feed this little beast. Now it's set up with mechanical secondaries, billet metering blocks and base plate, and down leg boosters. Now it's designed for drag race use and sports the satin black finish. A Spectre Extra Flow 14 inch air cleaner assembly will top it all off. This engine is a small package that's gonna pack a big punch. The dyno's next. Will our calculations come true? Stay with us.
little black and blue is hooked up and ready to run. So how much grunt is it going to put out? Well, with 347 cubic inches, a 10.4 to 1 compression ratio, the 205cc cylinder heads and the Victor Junior intake manifold all lit off by 93 octane, we're going to say 450. And with a little bit of Topolinsky's tuning, we know we'll see more. Here we go. The timing is being set to a safe 30 degrees to start out. Reason being, it's the initial pull and we want to make sure the pressures and temps stay where they should. With all those vitals looking good, see how she loads up. All right. Here goes the first pull from 2500 to 5800 RPM. Oh yeah, nice. Hooker's inch and 5 eighths long tubes helps it breathe. Dude, that's wow. Really, that's a really nice so engine. cool. That is a really nice engine. How cool is that? How cool is that? Oh my god. Holy I, cow. I, I think we've uh we underestimated ourselves. I think we've <laughs> underestimated it slightly. <laughs> 457 on power. Torque was 430. So this engine has no timing in it. None. Oh, oh. So we'll bring it up to 32 degrees. Remember, timing affects torque and carburetor jetting affects horsepower and they each affect each other. 466 on power, 439 on torque. Okay. Out of a 347, baby. <laughs> so we'll add two more for 34 degrees and raise the entire suite, starting at 3,500 and pulling out at 6,500 RPM. Oh, man, this thing is sweet. 494, 440. Wow. We're only adding one degree for this run. We are dangerously close to cracking 500 with this thing. <laughs> to give it a better chance, we're going to run the engine from 4,000 to 6,800 RPM. I think I saw it. I think I saw it. I think I felt it. 504, 446, yes! 504. And with 446 foot-pounds, we're done timing for torque. To lean it out at the top end and hope for a couple more numbers, the high speed air bleeds are going from 33s to 37s. Five oh seven four forty seven. Yep. Let's see what it did for horsepower per cube. One forty six. One forty six. Wow. That, that is a. Uh, and on the torque excellent. side, one two nine. That is excellent for pump gas. And it even exceeds Pat's pre-build calculations. That's it, baby. Phase one is complete. Phase one is done. That is awesome, Pat. That is awesome. That is an awesome engine. I like it. Nice job. Yeah, yeah. The parts list will be on the website. Once again, science and physics don't lie. These parts were matched up based on their capabilities and operating range. There are no secrets here. They're off-the-shelf parts with a solid build and good attention to detail. And who knows, at some point, this may be offered as a crate engine package from Summit Racing. Next time, we're going bigger on induction, valve train, and compression, and you don't want to miss that.